I'm going to continue what I started last several weeks ago. But I'm going to pick up where we left off about taking the limits off God. The children of Israel, yes, you can limit God, but we're taking all the limits off Summit Church so God can do what he wants to do in our life. And what I'm saying, and I'm going to keep saying it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That uh, God has more for you than what you're currently, presently experiencing right now. God has much more for your life than what's happening in your life right now. No matter how bad it is, no matter how good it is, God does not want you to live a mediocre life. Psalm 78, 41 says concerning Israel that time and time again that they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They, they limited God over and over again. Um, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We talked about how we have to expand our capacity to receive. God cannot bless you beyond your capacity to receive. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. If you only have a cup container, God can only give you a cup full of blessings. Now, he will bless you, but if you only think you should have a little, he'll only give you a little. But if you think you can have much, he'll give you much. If you think you can have more, he'll give you more. So we want to move past a cup, move past a bucket, capacity. Move past a barrel. Barrel can be pretty good. It's better than a cup. But God's got something more. He's got warehouse, barn size blessings for you. So you got to think that way. You got to believe that God wants you to have more. Well, isn't that selfish? No, it's not selfish. Because it's not all for you. It's about expanding his kingdom. And you can give more. You can help more people. You can give more uh, to the kingdom of God and help uh, send missionaries and support missionaries, build churches, help us to build our next facility. I'd like to pay cash. That's all I'm thinking. Let's just pay cash for another facility. Glory to God. Well, you have to think that way. Well, I, I don't know if I could if I could think we could pay for a building without going to the bank. God is able. But we've got to think that way in, in order to get there. And it starts with me as far as the church is concerned. But what about your house? God's big enough to pay your house off. It doesn't have to take you another 25 years. Believe God to pay it off. You got to think that way if you're going to experience that. See, whatever you want to experience on the outside, you first have to experience, experience it on the inside. Because as you think, Proverbs 23, 7, as you think, so you will be. All right? So let's work on our thinking. And how do you start expanding your thinking? Well, start thinking the way God wants you to think. Look, look in the Word of God and start seeing yourself the way God sees you because you are who God says you are. You have what God says you have, and you can do what God says you can do. Say it with me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am ready to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. And I boldly confess that I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hallelujah. So, why do people limit God? We talked about comparisons. People often compare themselves with other people, and they see other people struggling, so they think that they should struggle. They see an economic downturn, so they think, well, I guess uh, things are slow, and that's just the way it is, so we're just going to have to cut back on some things. Uh, no. God supplies all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's not according to the world's economy. Don't compare yourself with other people. Other people may be struggling, but that doesn't mean you need to struggle. And then another uh, way people limit God, another reason why people limit God is because of their lifestyle. They look at the, they, they're so caught up in the cares of the world that they don't spend enough time with God, and time in meditation, time looking into the Word of God and seeing themselves properly. See, when you see yourself properly, you understand you, you wear the victor's crown because he wears the victor's crown, and as he is, so are we in this world. Well, you've got to go to the Word of God so that when you're going through uh, life and uh, as you go about your day, the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you will bring the Word of God to your remembrance. He can't bring anything to your remembrance until you remember it. Uh, that, I just invented a word, but you get my point. You First of all, in order to remember something, you have to have it there in the first place, right? Okay. Now, now here's the one that we're spending a lot of time with because this trips up a lot of people, and that's fear. One major reason why, this might be the biggest reason, that people limit God is because they are afraid. The answer, the solution for fear. See, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. The answer for fear is love because perfect love casts out fear. But understand this. It's, what, what casts out fear? The love, understanding the perfect love that God has for you. He loves you perfectly. Not your love for God. Yes, we should love God. But it's, it's, don't focus on your love for him. Focus on his love for you. And when you understand how much God loves you, perfect love casts out fear. We talked about one kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. God may tell you to go start a business. What if God told you to go overseas and be a missionary? Well, I don't know. God told me to do it, but what's going to happen? How, how am I going to take care of myself? How, how am I going to pay the bills? If I, if I go and start this, if I start this work or, or whatever that God wants me to start, don't worry about none of that. Because when you understand he loves you perfectly, let, let's apply that verse to what God tells you to do. When you understand he loves you perfectly, you have a dynamic relationship with God because you, you, you change, you're being transformed as you're spending time in his presence. See, um, as we behold the, the glory of the Lord, as we look at God's face, as we look into the word of God, as we see the glory of the Lord, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 that we're changed into his image. We're, in other words, we're being transformed. That's what we come to church to do. See, you need to know why you're in church. We're here to change. We're not here to play a favorite song of yours. Oh, I like that song. I like that. But are you changed? There is a message in the song. In that groove, you might like that groove, but there's a message in it. We spend time with him. We, we spend time in his presence, and then we're changed. And so whatever God tells you to do, whether to start a work, start a business, start, uh, go and be a missionary and just to step out, a lot of people don't do it because of the fear of the un unknown. But when you understand God's perfect love for you, 
you under, you, you, and, and you're spending time in his presence, you get to know the one who holds the future. And you know that he wouldn't ask you to do anything that's going to hurt you. He always does things to bless you. Say, God, God never, does anything, never does anything or tells me to do anything, to do anything that's going to hurt me. He always does things. He always, things. He always, tells, me he always tells me to do things to bless me. To bless me. Yeah. It's all about trusting God. If he tells you to do something, he can sustain you wherever he tells you to go. In Hebrews, well, actually Hebrews references when God told Abraham to go out and um, leave your father's house and go into a land that I'm going to show you. He had to totally trust God. He had to leave his family. I think about my wife when, <laughs> when we went to Tulsa. I didn't realize until we got back to Fort Wayne after I spent two years in Bible school, I didn't realize that she, uh, the challenge that she faced. Carla never could leave home. She she tried to go to Ball State twice. Thinking of Ball State. Man, I, we got to have to take the limits off of God. Let me, let me give you a little commercial. Um, I can't even pr pronounce her last name. But the CEO of Burberry, that was basically a raincoat coat company until this lady took it over. She's a Ball State grad. Well, I don't know if she graduated. I, I understand no, I, from what I understand, she didn't even graduate. She, she left one class short of her degree to go to New York and pursue her dream. She's from New Palestine, Indiana, and went to pursue her dream and to get into the fashion industry. And uh, I graduated from Ball State in 1980. She left in 81 we may have been in some of the same classes in the business school. I have a business degree. Um, so she took over Burberry and was basically a raincoat company. And she took it now, everybody's wearing, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people wearing Burberry, Burberry scarves, Burberry ties, got the pattern of Burberry on their, on their stuff. And, that was under her leadership. And it's based in London. She was living in London. Um, right from right here in Indiana, she's, she was the CEO to turn that thing around. And she just left. I, Apple hired her as her vice president of uh, retail. She left $20 million a year. No, $27 million. $27 million, I think $19 million of that approximately, if I remember correctly, is were stocks. But that still leaves, what, eight, eight million? I tell you, church, Pastor, what are you talking about? Let's get back to your message. I'm talking about expanding your thinking. $27 million salary. What are we thinking? Did you get that? What are we thinking? This is not a person from Mars. This is a person who left to pursue their dream. Now, they didn't start there. But I, I need to go back and look, because she did a commencement address in 2010 to Ball State. Now, I went through, and she's a believer, by the way. I read that about it. I started reading. I started get, getting curious. And I'm going to go back and look at, she, I, I glanced at some of the things that she talked about, uh, about dreaming and, and the vision and something like that in, in her commencement address. I got off of that. At, I didn't forget. Talking about Carla. Well, she tried to go to Ball State a couple of times, but she just was a home person. And when I say a home person, she loves her family. She wanted to be with her family. She's never been away from home. 
So she tried to go to Ball State a couple times. One time, ironically, this is a little side issue, I tried to help her. Uh, actually, I had ulterior motives because I wasn't following God in those days. I was following skirts and uh, anything that moved. It didn't matter. I didn't discriminate. White, black, light skin, dark skin, didn't matter. I loved women. And so, uh, praise God, God helped me. And she was there. I, didn't, I had no idea she was going to be my wife. I was trying to help her just because I wanted to hit on her. And she wasn't interested in me at all. She just needed, she, I was just the only person she knew. <laughs> and she needed some help. And I would accommodate. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. And then when she got back home, and I wanted to see her when, we got, when she got back home, because she didn't last at Ball State, and I tried to see her back home, she didn't want anything to do with me, because she didn't need me then. See, she was just, she was just using me. What are y'all clapping for? Eh? There's nothing to clap about. Uh, but anyways, she thought she would go to Alabama uh, A&M. She thought if she would just, just could go far enough, then she wouldn't come back because months she could get back real quick. So she got on the bus and went to Alabama A&M. And, and, you know, everybody gets off the bus and so forth. Before that bus driver could turn the, the uh, bus off, she was back on that bus ready to come back home. It didn't ex happen exactly that way. I, th I think she... I think she waited till the next day. But if she could have got back on that bus. Why did I say that? Well, I don't know. No. When we went to Tulsa, see, I, I, I didn't realize how much of a challenge that she had two weeks after we got married. In uh, 82, we got married in August 82, two weeks after that, I'm off to Tulsa. Newlyweds off to Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, man. Y'all know anything about Tulsa, Oklahoma? That's a different kind of place. <laughs> but God, long story short, God helped her. She, she stepped out with me. She didn't leave. She stayed there and believed God. She trusted God. And by the time we left, when, she, when we went back home, she didn't want to leave Tulsa. Now, we went back to pursue another dream to start a, a church, but she didn't want to leave. See, God will take care of you where he sends you. Even if you don't know, he knows, and you trust him who holds your future in his hands. And you're here because we follow that vision. And when I came back, I didn't know who was going to come to the church. Some people I thought was going to help me start didn't. But we had some folk who did, like Tracy and Kitty. Amen. Amen. Eugene and June. Amen. Parker. Man, uh, I don't know if anybody else was... <laughs> was was uh, jo Joanne? Well, they, they came on the second wave. <laughs> they creeped over. They, they, well, well, I claim them. <laughs> Carolyn Barnett, Brenda Mudd, Joanne Goodson. And boy, they stuck with me after all those years. Man. So anyways, uh, we stepped out. My dad asked me, he says, uh, before I came back, he said, who's going to come to your church? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was so caught up in what God had told me to do, I wasn't really thinking about that. I had a few people to help me get started. I didn't know how many people were going to come. That's up to God. Look, you, you know, the important thing is he called me. 
He said, well, Pastor, that, that's, that's for you pastors and ministers. No, it's for, it, that just happens to be what I do. When I got into this, I, I, I mean, when I even went to Bible school, when, when God changed my life, I had no idea I was going to be a pastor. I didn't intend to do this. I was going to be a businessman, make a lot of money, and give to the kingdom. And had God not interrupted me, that's what I would have been pursuing. But you're here right now listening to me. Now that doesn't mean you wouldn't be following God. You just wouldn't be here. <laughs> and obviously you're here for a reason. Because it, it all, I mean, if you, you know, go all the way back, it, it goes back to what God called me to do. And I obeying. You see, you never know the results or the fruit of obeying God. I wouldn't know you wonderful people and hear these wonderful testimonies of what God does in your life as a result of you coming to this ministry. It happened because I obeyed God. And so when God tells you to do something, do it. Abraham stepped out, got away from his family and pursued what God told him to do. And God told him specifically, leave, <clears throat> leave your father's house and go to the land, a land where I will show you. Yeah. Now, Paul, who I believe was the writer of Hebrews, he says, he says this. From the Amplified, urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went forth to a place he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he went. Although he did not know or trouble his mind about where he was to go. Don't trouble your mind about where you're going to go. If God gives you step A, he's not going to necessarily give you, he's not going to give you all the steps. Just step out and do what he told you to do. Oh, gosh, I didn't, spend, I didn't mean to spend that much time there, but God wanted me to. So uh, let's go on to a fear of failure. This is where I told you I was going to, this is where we left off, right? And I got five minutes left. <laughs> See, some people are afraid. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid to step out. In Matthew 14, 22, we need to get out of our boat. See, people like to pick on Peter. Yeah, as long as he had his eyes on Jesus. I mean, he was cool, but then he started to, he, you know, he began to sink and, and so forth because he took his eyes off Jesus. We picked on him, but, but let's talk about those other folks who were afraid and never got out of the boat. That was pretty bold. Peter looking at Jesus walking on that water, and, and he was like, that is cool. I want to do that. Let's give him courage of stepping out. Before you pick on Peter, are you stepping out on what God has called you to do? I might not get to it today, but we're going to deal with this, this perfectionism. People failing to step out because they want everything to be perfect. Man, do you think everything was perfect when I started the ministry? I, talk, I, I mentioned those names. There's people that are still with me today, all the mistakes I've made over the years and stuff. I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. I knew a little bit. It's almost scary if I look back and I don't even want to listen to those tapes from what I taught years ago. And those folks still hung, in, hung with me after all those years. Now, I was, now one thing is, is, it hasn't changed. I'm teaching faith and how to believe God. And, but what I'm saying was it wasn't perfect. If you wait till something is perfect, you're never going to start. You can overcome the fear of failure, but when you're at the end of your life, there's nothing you can do about regret. And the pain that that brings, I wish I would have. 
God told me to do this 20 years ago, and I didn't do it. Do it now while you, while you can do something about it. Do something. Stretch your faith. Don't stand still. I'm never standing still. I'm always moving forward. I'm always living on the edge. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. (laughs) Immediately, Jesus told his followers to get into the boat and go ahead of him across the lake. He stayed there to send the people home, and after he had sent them away, he went by himself up into the hills to pray. It was late, and Jesus was there alone. By this time, the boat was already far away from uh, land. It was being hit by waves because the wind was blowing against it. Between there and 6 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the water. When his followers saw him walking on the water, they were what? They were afraid. They said, he said, goats, and they cried out for fear, but Jesus quickly spoke to them, have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, command me. He's waiting on Jesus to give him, in other words, permission to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. That's pretty cool. I want to watch that when I get to heaven. I mean, man, put, 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 that, put that Blu-ray disc or whatever the technology is in heaven. Put that on. I want to see that. I'm serious. I, I mean, I, I'm on, I think the first day in heaven, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to watch movies. <laughs> let me see the Red Sea now. Let me see David and Goliath. Uh, let me see Peter walking on the water, man. Let, let, let me see the resurrection. I think I'm going to watch that one first. You try to figure out. You imagine in heaven trying to figure out, what, what am I going to watch first? Let me start with the resurrection. And then, oh, oh, let me, oh, I want to see creation. Well, let, let's just start with Genesis. Man, I, I would like to be a movie producer. I, 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 I'd like to really uh, produce a movie that looks like what I see in the Bible. Uh, okay, Jesus, if it's really you, command me to come to you, to you on the water. He said, come on. <laughs> but Peter left the boat. That's what a lot of people don't do. That. They don't leave the boat. Don't pick on Peter. At least he got out of the boat. Eventually he sank because he took his eyes off Jesus. But that's not what I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on the fact that he stepped out. Some people are still in the boat. Still. You know. I don't know. And they sit there year after year. And they don't do what God has called them to do. And, and it, it all goes back to this a fear of, of failure. Sometimes it's the fear of the unknown. Sometimes it's, it's just this, the fear of failure is rooted in insecurity. Not being secure in Jesus. See, you should get your identity, your security from your relationship with him. But what a lot of people do, they get uh, their security, their identity comes from what they do. Some folks, they just want somebody uh, to approve them and approve of what they do. You know, a lot of times... 
people will try to discourage you for, from stepping out and doing what God has called you to do. The devil will make sure there's somebody that's around that will shoot it down. But you've got to have so much faith in the love he has for you that you'll push past all that and get out of the boat. Did you get something out of this? It's very quiet. Change sometimes is painful for people because it just... It's easy to just get mesmerized. Remember that guy, mesmerized, come from that guy, Mesmer, who hypnotized people. That's what the, the, the television does. It's easy to just flop down there instead of seeing yourself with the victor's crown. you rather get all your Colts gear. I'm a Colts fan. You understand? But people, they got to get all the gear. They got to have the Colts chair, the, the Colts... Uh, Everything, uh, whatever your team is, Steelers, you get all the stuff and you can flop down there, get that jersey, huh? And watch other people, watch life pass you by while other people succeed. And so you are, see, you want to succeed, but subconsciously what people do is they, they are living vicariously through their team. And their team's success and their mind equals their success. I'm doing better preaching than what you're saying, amen, right now. Because you feel like, you, and then you start identifying yourself. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, we didn't play good defense today. <laughs> them folk ain't going to give you a check. What the we? We didn't. Our passing game wasn't too good. I mean, nobody's even consulting you. <laughs> While you snoring. And getting up and, in, in, you know, they're working on film. They're, they're reviewing things. They're trying to improve. All you do is flop down in front of that TV and complain. You don't know how, how hard they work to do what they do. Well, the reason why we didn't win the Super Bowl. Listen, let me give you a revelation. Only one team can win. So if your success is based on some, some team winning the Super Bowl, you, the likelihood of your team winning is only a small percent. One out of 32. There's 32 teams, right? So most of the time you're going to lose. And even if you win this year, chances are you're not going to win next year. Well, Pastor, don't confess that. I mean, it's not about <laughs> confession. What are you talking about? I'm talking about reality and, and you... Um, Basing your success on stuff that you don't have no control over. But your life, you got control over your life and where you're going. 